So welcome to week three of Writing in the Sciences. I'm Kristen Sinani from Stanford University. So in the first two weeks of this course, we talked about some key principles of effective writing. So cutting unnecessary clutter from your sentences, and also writing with strong active verbs. So this week, I want to continue our discussion of good writing, talking about how to improve your sentence structure, and then also moving up all the way to writing good paragraphs. Uh, for this first module, I'm going to talk about experimenting with punctuation. Now, as I've mentioned before, this is not a course in grammar or punctuation, but there are a couple key punctuation marks that I want to draw your attention to. So these are some punctuation marks that you may not have dealt with for a while. So these are the dash, the colon, the semicolon, and the parentheses. And you may not have used a lot of these recently because you may have been told somewhere along the way that it's improper to use them in scientific writing or you just may have picked that up along the way that they don't get used often in scientific writing. And uh, they're a little too exotic or a little too informal. However, in fact, these are perfectly fine to use in scientific writing if you use them correctly as we're going to talk about today. And if you pick up any source of professional writing, like if you've got a magazine lying around or uh, a book, pick it up, take a look at one or two paragraphs, and you'll notice that professional writers use these tools all the time. And that's because they're super handy. They work really well. They have a lot of functions. They're very, very useful. So one of the major uses is that they allow you to vary your sentence structure. And that's something I'm going to talk a lot about today. So that means you know, we've been talking about, I've been showing you how to kind of strip all of this extra material out of your sentences, but that doesn't mean that I want you to write with only short and simple sentences. If you wrote just all short and simple sentences, you would see that your writing would be very boring, very monotonous. So I'm actually going to encourage you to vary your sentence structure and really pay attention to that. So that means using some complex sentences and some short and simple sentences, some long sentences, some short sentences. So vary that up. That helps improve the writing. It makes it less monotonous. It makes it more engaging for the reader. It's very, very hard to vary your sentence structure and make interesting sentence structure and write complex sentences if you don't use some of these punctuation marks. If you are limited to just commas and periods, there's going to, not going to be a lot you can do. So the dash, the colon, the semicolon, and the parentheses are ways that you can get creative with your sentence structure and make some nice, interesting, uh, complex sentences. So I'm going to give you an example of the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. So I, I'm going to give you an example of something that I edited where I used a colon to actually take three sentences and draw it into a single sentence. So for the most part so far, again, I've been sort of stripping things from our sentences. Today we're going to do something a little different, which is to aggregate multiple sentences into a single sentence where it's appropriate. That means I'm going to have a more complex sentence at the end of the day, but it's going to be more efficient because it's going to get the idea across in a single sentence. It's also going to be a little bit more interesting to read because of the variety in the sentence structure. So here's the original thing that I was editing. It said, Many types of cells and tissues develop a kind of directionality. Certain events happen toward one end of the cell or tissue or the other. It's a phenomenon called cell polarity. And so it's okay, it's, you know, it's kind of simple language, uh, but it's a little bit boring, right? Um, you know, they kind of have all those sentences have the same kind of simple structure to them. And really the purpose of those three sentences is simply to tell you what cell polarity is. So it doesn't seem like we really need to have three separate sentences there. So what I did when I was editing this was to use a colon to introduce the definition of cell polarity and to kind of pull all these little pieces that the author wants to get in, to pull them all together. You can see that I actually didn't change a heck of a lot uh, from the original other than to kind of pull everything together and, and, and in doing so I was able to drop a few words. So it says many cells and tissues develop a kind of directionality called cell polarity. Colon, I'm setting up the definition, certain events happen toward one end of the cell or tissue. So uh, there's probably even more we could edit out of that sentence, but you can see that I pulled everything together into a single sentence. It's got a colon to set up that definition. Now we only need one sentence, and it's a little bit more interesting to read because it's got this variety, having this colon in there where you have to take a pause. It's a little bit more interesting. So this is the kind of thing we're going to be talking about today. So just to kind of ground you in the different types of punctuation I'm going to be talking about today. Here are the punctuation marks that we have at our disposal, and here is their power to separate, in the words of Strunk and White. So Strunk and White talk about their power to separate, and that's a good way to put it, I think. 
So um, you're probably all really adept at using the comma and the period. So the comma is the, has the least power to separate, and the period, of course, has the most power to separate. But in between the comma and the period, there are these four other really fun and useful punctuation marks that you can use to place pauses and breaks in your sentences. So the comma has the least power to separate. That means it's the shortest little pause. It's just a kind of a brief pause in your sentence. The colon is a bigger pause. So you're going to take a little bit of a bigger pause, a bigger break. The dash is an even bigger pause. And I love the dashes you're going to see. It has a lot of great uses. It allows you to actually kind of just drop whole descriptions, whole explanations right in the middle of your sentence, and your reader's totally OK with it. We're not going to overuse the dash, but it is a really cool punctuation mark. So it's a pretty abrupt uh, power to separate, a pretty abrupt pause there. Then a parenthesis, of course, is something where you're actually inserting something extra into the sentence. So it's a really big pause. A semicolon actually demarcates uh, the boundary between two separate sentences that, are, that you want to connect in a way. So, but there's really kind of um, a, a fairly big pause because they're actually considered two separate sentences. And then a period, of course, is a complete stop. So that's your biggest pause. So that's sort of the order uh, of how these uh, punctuation marks go in terms of their power to separate. Now, the other thing to talk about is that there is a little bit of difference in terms of the formality. And this is why you may have been told before not to use some of these punctuation marks. But in general, the dash and the parentheses are considered slightly less informal than the comma, colon, semicolon, and period. So that's why you may have, been, have in the past been somewhat discouraged from using the dash and parentheses. So they are a little bit less formal, but that doesn't mean that you can't use them at all in your scientific writing. Again, if you look at professional writing, professional writers use these all the time, the dash and the parentheses. It just means that you have to use them a little bit sparingly. You don't want to overdo it with the dash and the parentheses. And we'll be talking more about that as we go along here. All right, so I'm going to start with the semicolon. That's the one that you're probably all the most comfortable, uh, comfortable with. So the semicolon is used to connect two independent clauses. It's basically bringing together two kind of small sentences that you want to connect to join in some way. Um, I am going to be using the word clause today, in case you don't know what that is. It's basically just below a sentence in rank. So uh, it can be a, a very short sentence, or it may be an incomplete sentence, but it always has a, both a subject and a predicate, a subject and a verb. So um, just so you know what that term is when I throw that around today. So, uh, so here's a couple of examples of the use of the semicolon to, semicolon to join two independent clauses. So it says, Kennedy could be a cold and vain man, and he led a life of privilege. But he knew something about the world. He also cared about it. So notice the use of the semicolon in that second sentence. You're getting this separation of these two ideas. He knew something about the world. He also cared about it. There's a kind of a pause there, and it kind of puts emphasis on the he also cared about it. You can think about how this would have worked or it wouldn't have worked as well had other punctuation marks been used there. So for example, the author could have said, but he knew something about the world and also cared about it. Right? He could have just had a comma or just a, you know, no punctuation there and run those two ideas together. Now the, the difference there would have been that there wouldn't have been the same emphasis on he also cared about it. right? So that's something to keep in mind. It emphasizes, it puts some emphasis on that second part. It also, uh, had you used a period there, it wouldn't have joined those two ideas together. And there's this nice, you know, uh, feeling here where you're joining those two ideas together. Another example of the, of the semicolon, sort of a classic example of the use of the semicolon, this is from Dickens, uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Now, uh, clearly, the semicolon is playing a real important role here because it's joining those two ideas. And this sentence, or these two you know, small sentences here, wouldn't actually really work very well if it weren't for the semicolon. If you put a, a full period in there, they wouldn't be tied together in that nice way. And it actually probably would kind of fall apart. So the semicolon is really great for when you want to link two kind of smaller sentences together and link them. Tell the reader, hey, I, you know, these ideas are joined. And it gives some emphasis that you don't get otherwise. So that's one use of the semicolon. The other use of the semicolon that's going to be common in scientific writing is that semicolons are sometimes used uh, to separate items in a list. And, and specifically, when you've got a list of items where the items in the list contain internal punctuation. So that means that there might be commas within the items in the list. 
And you can see that if you then try to set off the items in the list with commas, because there are commas within the items, it's going to get really confusing. You're not going to know where the boundaries are between the items in the list. So you need something that's stronger power to separate, so you would use a semicolon there. So you're probably uh, mostly familiar with this. You may have done this in your scientific writing before. But here's an example. They dramatically reduced the number of series in production. Notice the use of a colon here. We're going to get to a colon next. Uh, in 1935, 14 series were circulating. Notice the internal comma there, hence you need the semicolon to separate the item in the list. In 1949, by 1980, when the syndicate was in its final, four year, final years, only four. So you can see because of the internal commas there, you clearly need a semicolon to demarcate the boundaries of the items in the list. So that's another use of the semicolon that you may frequently uh, find uh, you need. Okay, next thing, moving along to the parentheses. So the parentheses is used to insert an afterthought, an explanation, some additional details, to insert it into a passage, usually a, uh, you know, into a sentence, that is grammatically complete without it. Uh, and it might be, you might be inserting a word or a phrase, or you might even be inserting a whole sentence into a, a passage. So uh, if you remove the material within the parentheses, however, the sentence has to remain grammatically complete. In other words, you can completely remove that piece and it shouldn't change the main point of the sentence. It should be grammatically the same, it shouldn't change the main point. So it's really an afterthought. And in fact, when you put material in parentheses, you're actually indicating to your reader that it's perfectly okay should the reader want to skip over the material with their eyes. They just want to kind of read over it and ignore it. So it's a way that you can add some extra information that may not be the most important information, but it may be some little interesting tidbit. It may be a more subtle, less important detail that you think is important to slip in there, but you don't want to have too much in a sentence. So you kind of slip it in in parentheses. It's a way to get some extra information to your reader. You might put something in parentheses where you think uh, some readers may not know the definition, but others may. So by putting it in parentheses, you're saying, well, if you know the definition to this word, you can skip over it. But if you don't know it, it's here if you need it. Uh, so it's a, it's a really cool way to, to slip in a little extra information. But again, the key to using the parentheses correctly is you have to try taking it out of the sentence and make sure the sentence still reads fine without it and that the main point of the sentence doesn't change because you have to allow for the fact that your reader actually may skip over it entirely and they're allowed to do that. So let me give you a couple of examples. So this was, I, I picked up something, uh, I was reading something in Newsweek the other day. Uh, I picked up a, a sentence from there. So it says, what kind of teenager beats up the misfit sissy kid, pinning him down and violently cutting his hair with a pair of school scissors? Note the use of a dash here. The, incidents, the incident from Romney's youth that the Washington Post famously reported, and Romney, Romney famously didn't really deny, back in May. So notice that the author here has slipped in a little piece of information that he wants to clue you into, but it's not necessary, again, that, you, that that piece be in there. You could take that piece out completely and it would read fine, uh, you know, and it, it's not absolutely essential. So the incident from Romney's youth that the Washington Post, Post famously reported back in May, that would read fine, but the author really wants to give you this little extra piece of information, so he's kind of sliding it in there. Uh, because it's in parentheses, you can get more things in the sentence uh, that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to, to fit in. Here's an example. This was actually from an article I was writing about statistics, and I slipped in a little, sort of a joke. I was trying to be a little funny, so again, I've encouraged you to take some risks in your writing, so I don't know if this joke came off all right or, or not, but anyway, I slipped it in there with some parentheses. So it says, this is troubling because while there are plausible biological stories to connect red meat with cancer and heart disease, it seems unlikely that eating too much red meat could directly cause accidents and injuries. And then here's my little, you know, trying to entertain the reader a bit. Unless, as one of my students quipped, red meat eaters are swerving to avoid cows. So this was an article about um, statistics, about confounding. Anyway, I slipped that in there with some parentheses. All right, so moving to the colon. Now the colon has several uses. You can use a colon. Colon always has to come after a clause. So again, that means you have to have a subject and a verb, a subject and a, a predicate. So you always have that before the colon, and then the colon introduces, often introduces a list, or it might introduce a quote, 
we don't use so many quotes in scientific writing, but if you are using quotes, you can use a colon to introduce it. Or it might introduce an explanation, a conclusion, or an amplification. And I'm going to give you some examples of all of those to show you what I mean. And Strunk and White, I'm going to refer a lot in this lecture to Strunk and, Strunk and White. They have some, uh, some great material on these different punctuation marks. And I'll give you the, the reference at the end if you want to go and look at Strunk and White online. And they say the colon has more effect than the comma, less power to separate than the semicolon, and more formality than the dash. So again, as I told you, the colon is more powerful than the comma in terms of its ability to separate. Uh, but the, the uh, semicolon has more power than a colon. And the semicolon uh, and the colon are considered a little bit more formal than the dash. Here's an example of using a colon for both a list and sort of an amplification. So it says, Washington has a simple solution to most governments it doesn't like. Isolate them, slap sanctions on them, and wait for their downfall. So this is interest, introducing uh, you know, it's a list, and it's also a bit of an amplification. This was uh, something I must have been reading, I think, in Newsweek. Here's another example. This one's actually kind of setting up a punchline. So it says, the woman suffers from lack of experience and a chronic democratic disease, compound sentences. A little bit of a punchline there. All right, I'm just going to show you that the use of the colon to introduce quotes. Again, we don't always or very often use uh, quotes in scientific writing, but it, it sometimes comes up. So this says, and again, this was something I was reading in uh, the New Yorker or Newsweek. The ask not line follows right after an exhortation modeled on Franklin Roosevelt's rendezvous with destiny. Colon, this is introducing a quote, in the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. And then in the next sentence, there's another colon that's used to introduce a list of quotes. So it says, the note throughout is one of alarm, colon. The trumpet summons us again. The burden of a long twilight struggle, that uncertain balance of terror. Um, I want to point out one other thing about this list at the end here. So notice that that's a list of three things. So the, the author was trying to pick out some examples of quotes uh, from this speech to illustrate a point. And he picked to and decided to include in his list three examples. Now he could have picked two of those examples. He could have picked, there's probably way more in the speech that he could have picked. He could have picked four, he could have picked five. But notice that oftentimes when an author is giving you a list of things, especially examples, they'll often limit it to three things. And this gets to a principle that I want to mention to you, which is called the rule of threes. So the rule of threes is used when you're making lists or giving examples in your writing. Uh, it's a rule of thumb. It doesn't mean you always have to use three. But when you're in doubt, when you're not sure, or there's some ambiguity about how many is the correct number to include, default to three. And the idea here is that kind of three is just the ideal number uh, of examples or items in a list. And, and the reason is that if you only put two items or two examples, there's a feeling that it's not enough, right? It's not giving enough evidence. It's only a pair of examples. It's not quite sufficient. However, if you go up to four or five, you're kind of burdening your reader. It's a little bit of overkill. So there's this thought that three is kind of the perfect number for these kinds of situations. Again, that doesn't mean that there's plenty of lists you're going to have that, has, that have four or five items. Uh, but if there's some ambiguity, if you get to make a choice on how many items, and it's a little bit kind of random how many, whether you include three or four, default to three, because that's kind of the most pleasing number. So here's an example. Uh, I gave you a similar example uh, of a sentence uh, similar to this earlier to illustrate the use of uh, semicolons in a list. But let me use this sentence again to illustrate the point that they happen to pick exactly three numbers here. So they gradually reduced the number of employees. In 1980, the company had 300 employees. In 1995, 150. By 2005, when the company was in its final years, only 11. Now notice that they're talking about a range of years here, from 1980 all the way up to 2005. So they very well could have picked 1980 and 1982 and 1995 and 1997 and 2005. They could have picked five examples, or they could have picked two. But they chose to go with three here, because three just kind of feels like the right number to illustrate the point, but without having too much in that list. So again, default to the rule of threes when you're thinking about lists and, and examples, if there's, some, uh, you know, if there's some wiggle room there for how many things you have to include. All right, one more example of the colon. So um, again, the colon can introduce 
uh, an explanation, an amplification, a definition. And I just want to point out that sometimes the colon is actually used, what, what follows after the colon is itself a, a whole clause. So I told you that the, what comes before the colon has to be an independent clause. You can also have the cases where you've got um, after the colon is an entire sentence, essentially, is a, an entire clause with a subject and predicate. And there may be some choice, because remember I told you the semicolon is used to join independent clauses. So there may be some choice between whether to use a semicolon when you have that situation or a colon. So you want to use the colon probably more so than the semicolon if the second clause amplifies somehow or extends the first. So here's an example of that. Companies use Marsh for the same reason that home sellers use real estate agents, colon. The agent's knowledge and experience is supposed to help the client get the right deal at the right price. So notice that that first clause sets up the second one. And if you tried to put a semicolon in there, it wouldn't feel quite right because it's a setup. That first clause is setting up the second one. The second one is amplifying or extending the first one. So a colon feels better there than a semicolon because it's not a complete pause because there's a, there's a relationship where the second part actually amplifies or builds on the first part. So that's a way to use the colon as well. So what follows the colon might itself be a whole sentence or a whole clause. So those are some examples of how to use the colon. I want to point out a few misuses of the colon because sometimes people uh, get a little confused on how to, to use it. So a couple of things that you don't want to do when using the colon. So here's an example of what not to do. So this one says, uh, two aspects of alcohol use are related to brain injuries. Notice they've got the, the subject and the verb, so that's correct. They use the colon. And then it goes, as a factor associated with risk of an injury, such as motor vehicle crash, and as a factor in traumatic brain injury diagnosis, recovery, or survival after injury. So notice that it sounds funny when I read that out loud, because they're saying two aspects are related to brain injuries. So aspects are nouns. So what follows the colon, what your, the reader is expecting there is nouns. But what they get instead is as, a, proposi a preposition. They're getting prepositions there. So that's, that's funny because the reader is expecting nouns. So if you set up nouns, you've got to follow with nouns. So the correct way to do this one would be to say something like, two aspects of alcohol use are related to brain injuries. Its association, that's a noun, its association with risk of injury, such as motor vehicle crash, and its post-injury influences on diagnosis, recovery, or survival after injury. So you've got to change those to nouns because that's what the setup had led the reader to believe was coming. There's another use, misuse of the, of the colon. This was actually uh, from an email I got about a job announcement many years ago. Uh, and they, I thought it was kind of funny because they'd reversed uh, the colon, what comes before and after the colon. So the list, when you're setting up a list for the colon, the list comes after the colon, not before the colon. So they said, in one project, we have a nutritionist, a psychologist, statisticians, a computer specialist, and dietitians, colon, a whole range of specialties. Well, of course, that's backwards. We want to set up the list with the colon and then have the list follow. So you, correct would be, in one project, we have a whole range of specialties, a nutritionist, a psychologist, statisticians, a computer specialist, and dietitians. It's interesting that they have multiple statisticians and multiple dietitians, but only one of, one of each of the others. I think this was a job advertisement for, for statistics, actually. So just be careful on the colon, because sometimes it is misused. All right, I'm going to end here with my favorite punctuation mark, which is the dash. Uh, you can use the dash to add emphasis or to insert a, kind of a, an abrupt uh, definition or description. And you can really kind of drop anything you want in the middle of the sentence by setting it off with dashes. And so it's really kind of a nifty tool because it's very versatile. So uh, you've got an extra little thought you want to drop in, an extra description. You can kind of just insert it in, and it very neatly works. The reader's OK with that kind of abrupt break, that interruption to the sentence. The reader's OK with it. So it's really uh, a cool tool. I will warn you, however, that you don't want to overuse it, because as I mentioned, it's a, considered just a little bit less formal than the other punctuation marks. And if you overuse it, it also really loses its impact. And so um, I can remember. Uh, when I was taking my very first journalism class, uh, the instructor told us that it was okay to use the dash. And I, I thought this was just the greatest liberation to be able to write with a dash. So uh, I was using dashes all over the place. And 
um, in my very first uh, assignment that I turned into my editor for um, an internship I was doing, I got a little note back on the top that said you can't use the dash so much. So I learned quickly to not overuse the dash. So you have to be a little bit careful to use it uh, sparingly, but it's a really great tool when you need it. And Strunk and White say a dash is a mark of separation stronger than a comma, less formal than a colon, and more relaxed than parentheses, kind of indicating it's, uh, you know, more relaxed. It, you know, again, it's kind of this abrupt, abrupt uh, interruption. And uh, they do warn you to use a dash only when a more common mark of punctuation seems inadequate. So again, use this sparingly, kind of reserve this tool for the really tough jobs. But do use it because it's a great tool. So I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of how this dash works. So here's an example. This is an example where using the dash kind of adds emphasis to the part that's in the dash. So the drugs did more than prevent new fat accumulation. They also triggered overweight mice to shed significant amounts of fat, dash, up to half their body weight. So notice how the use of the dash here really emphasizes how big that effect size was. So another example of the dash. Again, the dash is going to be used to kind of just drop things into the sentence, some extra information that you want to get in there. So it says, to establish that the marrow cells, also called adult stem cells or endothelial precursor cells, can colonize the eye, Friedlander and his colleagues first transplanted stem cells from an adult mouse into the eyes of a newborn mouse. So notice that the author here is sticking some extra information, telling you what else marrow cells are called, alerting you to these other names for marrow cells by sticking it in the dash. Now, there are other options, right? The author there might have chosen to put that information in parentheses. But again, if they put it in parentheses, they're indicating to the reader that it's not as important. So this author thought it was really important to make the point that, hey, marrow cells, which we also call stem cells, which is you know a word that m many people might know, um, it was important to make that point. So he wanted to get that extra information in, so he used a dash. Now, I want to look at how the feel of these sentences would change if you, instead of using a dash, chose some other punctuation mark, like a parentheses or a comma. So let's go back to that first example and try it with a comma instead. You're going to notice it's kind of clunky and long. So if I replace the dash here with a comma, we get the drugs did more than prevent new fat accumulation. They also triggered overweight mice to shed significant amounts of fat up to half their body weight. It kind of takes away the emphasis on the up to half their uh, body weight. It makes it a little bit more clunky there. And of course, if you use commas to separate that extra information in this second sentence, that's going to almost make this a run-on sentence. There's just too much going on uh, in this sentence. There isn't an abrupt enough pause. So to establish that the marrow cells, also called adult stem cells or endothelial precursor cells, can colonize the eye, Friedlander and his colleagues first transplanted, it just becomes really long and clunky. So you need something more powerful to separate right there. All right, a couple more examples of the dash. Oh, well, let me show you actually first uh, with the parentheses instead. If, if you used a parentheses in those two examples rather than um, a dash. So in that first example, if I use a dash for uh, up to half their body weight, remember that put emphasis. If I use a parentheses here instead, it kind of completely buries the information. It's like, oh, it's up to half their body weight. Like, that isn't important or exciting or interesting. Where in fact, that's the most important and interesting part, that it was so big. Now, if you put a, the material in that second sentence within parentheses, again, that not, that's not necessarily wrong in this case. Uh, it's just indicating to the reader that that's inessential information. So it almost depends on your audience in this case, right? If you were writing for an audience where you expected that most people would know that marrow cells were also called these other cells, these other names, then you might put that information, bury that information in parentheses, just for those of you who don't know. Here's that extra information. However, if you were writing to an audience where you thought most of them wouldn't know these alternate names for marrow cells, which in this case the author was, then setting them out with uh, dashes is more effective because it forces the reader to look at those and, and think about those carefully. So when you put in parentheses here, again, you're kind of saying, well, I'm expecting most readers already know this. Um, in this case, the author didn't think most, author, most of the readers would know that piece of information. All right, a few more examples. So here's another sentence where a dash was used. So researchers who study shipworms say these mislabeled animals, they're clams, not worms, are actually a scientific treasure. So this use of the dash adds emphasis to that cute little interesting fact that 
these these ship worms are actually not worms at all, but they're clams. So it's a way to drop this extra information in, in a kind of a cute little way. It gives emphasis to that interesting little fact. And notice how it's just kind of literally dropped right into the sentence. You can kind of drop it in wherever you want with uh, dashes, and the reader's okay with that. They, the reader understands that, hey, this means I, I'm going to have a little interruption here. And the reader's okay with that. So that's very powerful. One more example. I pulled this out of something I was reading in the New Yorker. So it says, the store, which is windowless and has clutters, clusters of unsmiling security guards standing at its entrances, as if it were the embassy of a particularly beleaguered nation, caters to rich Brazilians, members of the 10% of the population who command nearly half the national income and wear Chanel, Valentino, or Dolce & Gabbana. So notice that there's just this whole great long description just dropped right into the middle of the sentence. And notice that it's okay for the reader. Again, the reader's okay with that because that's the expectation with the dash. You can do that with a dash. And notice also that last week I talked about keeping the subject and the main verb of the sentence up together close to the beginning of the sentence. So you might think that this sentence actually kind of violates that rule, right? The store and then we get all this description and then caters. But in fact, because it's set off in dashes, the reader's okay with that. The reader is okay with you putting the verb afterwards. It works just fine. It's a long sentence, but it works. So, uh, so you can violate that rule if you're setting things off in dashes like that. So it's a way to insert a long description. So let me just show you what would happen if instead of using a dash in those two instances, I used a comma or a parentheses instead. So with commas instead, go to that first sentence. Researchers who study shipworms say these mislabeled animals, their clams, not worms, are actually a scientific treasure. Well, that's a run-on sentence, right? Commas aren't strong enough to set off an entire clause here. So clearly, commas are not going to work. And then in that second um, sentence, you know, again, it's getting really long-winded. The store, which is windowless and has clusters of unsmiling, blah, 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 it just, it's, it's running on and your, and your reader's going to get lost. Your reader's especially going to get lost here because you get this really long description with several commas in it and you don't get to the verb until caters. And this is a case where the verb now is too far from the subject because you have too much in between where it's not clearly demarcated and set off with um, dashes. So this is going to lose the reader. It's too long-winded without an abrupt pause. How about if we use parentheses instead? So with parentheses instead, in that first sentence, you could, right, you could set that information off, their clams, not worms, in parentheses, just to as kind of extra information. But notice there's a couple of problems with that. It, it buries the information, and this is kind of a really cute little interesting fact. Also, if you read it without um, that, if you take the material in parentheses out, if you read researchers who study shipworms, say this, these mislabeled animals are actually a scientific treasure, you are assuming that the reader also know, al already knows why they're mislabeled, right? You're assuming that the reader has that piece of information so they don't need you to put it there. It's extra information. So, so that's an assumption you probably shouldn't make because probably most readers don't actually know that fact. So, uh, so the parentheses aren't um, great here because they really bury the information and they're assuming too much of the reader. And if you use parentheses with that second example from uh, the story from the New Yorker, uh, the store, which is windowless and has blah, blah, blah. If you, if you put that whole beautiful description in parentheses, it just completely takes away from the description as if that description is not important. Um, so that really doesn't work either. All right, so I'm going to give one more example of the use of the dash to end on here. Uh, but this one you have to bear with me a little bit because it takes a little bit of setup before I get to this sentence. I have to give you a little bit of background for you to understand just how great this sentence is. Um, so you need to know a little bit about baseball, not too much about baseball, but uh, a little bit about baseball here. So I'm going to give you the background. So I'm not a, a particular, particularly big baseball fan or anything, but I did grow up in New England, and so therefore I am a diehard Red Sox fan. So uh, probably most of you are familiar with the Red Sox, and you probably have heard that at one time the Red Sox sort of were thought to have a curse on them. So uh, the Red Sox went 86 years without winning a World Series, and they were said to have a curse, and it was because, basically, it wasn't just that they didn't win the World Series and had this long, dry spell, uh, period. It was that they got within, you know, a hair's breadth of winning the World Series several times, and then just, it just, they just lost it on the stupidest errors. And so they got really, really close, and they thought they were cursed because they, they should have won, but they didn't. 
And so um, many of you may recall, I, well, I was old enough to, uh, I, am, I am old enough to, uh, to actually recall the, when this happened in 1986, a near miss. And so uh, the Red Sox were ahead in the World Series. They were one game ahead in the World Series. It's, it's game six, and so the way the World Series works is you have to win four. So they had won three already. If they won this game, they would win the World Series. It was against the Mets. And they got to the 10th inning, they were ahead, they had, uh, you know, they'd gotten ahead in the 10th inning. So all they had to do was get the other team out. They're two outs down, one out to go. It's pretty much over, right? The, the, the TV announcers popping the champagne. My whole family, I was pretty young then, my whole family went to bed. We thought it was over, it was late. Um, just one little out to go. Well, what happens, uh, of course, for those of you uh, who know or if you don't know, uh, it's a routine grounder. Should have been caught, should have been an easy, easy out. But what happens? The ball goes through. Uh, this is the infamous uh, error by Bill, Nup Bill Buckner. The ball goes through Bill Buckner's legs. They don't get the out. The Mets go on to win that game. Not only that, but they then go on to win the next game in the series. They win the World Series. The Red Sox, who were this close, lost it. So, uh, so that's sort of the, the history of the Red Sox. That, you need to know to kind of understand this example I'm going to give. So I'm going to dial forward now to 2004. So in 2004, the Red Sox finally, after 86 years, won the World Series. And it was done in dramatic fashion. So they were down three games in the American League Series, and they came back to win four in a row against the Yankees, so they made it to the World Series. They won three in a row against the Cardinals. So now all they got to do is win that last game, and they've done it. They've won the World Series. So fourth game, they're ahead in the fourth game, it's down to the last inning, they're winning, it's down to two outs, there's just that one out to go. Um, so everybody of course is on pins and needles because everybody's just waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? They're waiting for the, the, the curse to show it, to rear its head. Um, so the, the batter comes up, it's a routine grounder to the pitcher, the pitcher picks it up and now normally in these kinds of cases you would throw the ball uh, to, to the first baseman, and it's not a very long distance. The baseman would catch it, and that would be it. Pitcher doesn't do that, right? The pitcher knows the whole history of the Red Sox. Doesn't want to take the chance that something's going to go wrong in the middle of that uh, toss to first base. So literally, the pitcher kind of trots right up to the first baseman, gets about as close as he can to the first baseman, and tosses the ball underhanded into the first baseman's glove. You know, literally just got as close as he could to make sure that it made it into that guy's glove. He made the out, and uh, it was as careful as he possibly could be. So he made the out. They did win the World Series. Uh, but that whole gesture of going up to the first baseman and being so extra careful sort of just encapsulated the whole history, the whole 86-year history of the Red Sox. Okay, so that was a really long setup, I realize, but you'll, you'll appreciate it when you see this sentence and this use of the dash. So here's the sentence. It says, baseball is the only game that's played every day, which is why its season often seems endless. Right up to the inning and the out, dash, the little toss over to first base, when wow, it ends. So that little toss over to first base, that's the reference to the pitcher kind of walking up to first base and just lobbing the ball right to him. So you can see that's a really, really powerful sentence if you kind of know that whole background. The author here has dropped this whole very powerful image right into the middle of the sentence and done it so effectively. And the only way you could really do this here is with a dash. So I, I just love this sentence. I think this is by uh, Roger Angel is the writer of this one. Um, and let me just show you what would happen if we used other punctuation here. Clearly it's not going to be effective. So what if we used commas here? So if you used commas, baseball is the only game that's played every day, which is why it's season often seems endless right up to the inning and the out, the little toss over to first base when wow it ends. It's just, there's no emphasis on that amazing image. Uh, if I used a parentheses instead, of course, it would completely bury that little image and make it seem like that wasn't important, but of course it is. So uh, you can see that parentheses isn't strong enough here uh, either. It's like that, that image wasn't this powerful image. So clearly the dash has this really great use. Again, uh, don't overuse it, um, but do try to use it sometimes because you'll see it's just this really great tool that you have in your toolbox. I want to end here with a couple of references and citations. 
So uh, I've been referencing Strunk and White quite a bit, and um, that's the elements of style. You can actually access the entire text of that online, so if you have some extra time, you can go to that um, link there, and you can read Strunk and White, and it probably wouldn't take you more than a couple of hours. It's pretty short. And they go over a lot of the same kinds of things that I'm talking about in this class, but it's a really good reference. Uh, the other thing I'm going to put on uh, this slide here is, um, as I mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago, I don't usually give exact citations for these little snippets, uh, these little sentences that I pull from here and there. But today, since most of the sentences I was showing were examples of the good use of punctuation and, and good writing, I wanted to just acknowledge the various authors uh, from which I pulled those little uh, sentences. Uh, uh, those were mostly from uh, Newsweek and The New Yorker and a, and a couple of other sources. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.